So every decade to 15 years, energy costs in these states double. In some cases and in some months, our energy costs are increasing by 11% a month. But the ability to actually generate energy is now effectively zero. Marginal the, cost of energy going to zero? Because I, I have no idea what you're talking about. That is fascinating. Can I give you the 30 seconds? Sure. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. So if you look inside of the two most progressive states, the three most progressive states, New York, California, and Massachusetts, a lot of left-leaning folks, a lot of people who believe in climate science and climate change, the energy costs in those three states are the worst they are in the entire country. And energy is compounding at 3 to 4% per annum. So every decade to 15 years, energy costs in these states double. In some cases and in some months, our energy costs are increasing by 11% a month. But the ability to actually generate energy is now effectively zero. The cost per kilowatt hour to put a solar panel on your roof and a battery wall inside your garage, it's the cheapest it's ever been. They're, these things are the most efficient they, they've ever been. And so to acquire energy from the sun and store it for your use later on, literally is a zero cost proposition. So what's, how do you explain the gap between the cost going Great up? Great question. So this is the other side of regulatory capture, right? You know, we all fight to build monopolies. While there are monopolies hiding in plain sight, the utilities are a perfect example. There are 100 million homes in America. There are about 1,700 utilities in America. So they have captive markets. But in return for that captive market, the law says need to invest a certain amount per year in upgrading that power line in changing out that turbine, in making sure you transition from coal to wind or whatever. Just as an example, upgrading power lines in the United States over the next decade is a $2 trillion proposition. These 1,700 organizations have to spend, I think it's a quarter of a trillion dollars a year just to change the power lines. That is why, even though it costs nothing to make energy, you are paying double every five, every seven or eight years. It's CapEx and OpEx of a very brittle old infrastructure. It's like you trying to build an app and being forced to build your own data center. And you say, but wait, I just want to write to AWS. I just want to use GCP. I just want to move on. All that complexity is solved for me. And some law says, no, you can't. You got to use it. So that's what consumers are dealing with. But it's also what industrial and manufacturing organizations, it's what we all deal with. So how do we get rid ourselves of this old infrastructure that we're paying so, for? The thing that's happening today, which I think is, this is why I think it's the most important trend right now in the world, is that 100 million homeowners are each going to become their own little power plant and compete with these 1,700 utilities. And uh, that is in the United great, States or globally? No, just, just deal with the United States for a second, because I think it's easier to see here. 100 million homes, solar panel on the roof, and by the way, just to make it clear, the sun doesn't need to shine, right? These these panels now work where you have these UV bands that can actually extrapolate beyond the visible spectrum. So they're usable in all weather conditions. And a simple system can support you collecting enough power to not just run your functional day-to-day -day life, but then to contribute what's left over back into the grid for Google's data center or Facebook's data center where you get a small check. The cost is going to zero. How obvious is this to people? You're making Not a obvious. sound? Okay, so because this is a pretty profound prediction. If the cost is, is indeed go to zero, that, I mean, the compute, the cost of compute going to zero, I can... So the cost of compute going to zero is can kind of understand, see. but the it's energy basically. seems like a radical prediction of yours. Well, but, it, it's just it's just naturally what's happening. Right now, now let me let me give you a, diff a different way of explaining this. If you look at any system, there's a really important thing that happens. It's what uh, Clay Christensen calls crossing the chasm. If you explained it numerically, here's how I would explain it to you, Lex. If you introduce a disruptive product, typically what happens is the first three to five percent of people are these zealous believers, mm -hmm. and they ignore all the logical reasons why this product doesn't make any sense because they believe in the proposition of the future and they buy it. The problem is at 5%. If you want a product to get to mass market, you have one of two choices, which is you either bring the cost down low enough or the feature set becomes so compelling that even at a high price point. An example of the latter is the iPhone. The iPhone today, the 14 iPhone, costs more than the original iPhone. It's probably doubled in price over the last 14 or 15 years, but we view it as an essential element of what we need in our daily lives. It turns out that battery EVs and solar panels are an example of the former because people like President Biden with all of these subsidies have now introduced so much money for people to just do this where it is a 
money-making proposition for 100 million homes. And what you're seeing as a result are all of these companies who want to get in front of that trend. Why? Because they want to own the relationship with 100 million homeowners. They want to manage the power infrastructure. Amazon, Home Depot, Lowe's, you know, you can just name the company. So if you do that and you control that relationship, they're going to show you, they're going to, you know, for example, Amazon will probably say, if you're a member of Prime, We'll stick the panels on your house for free. We'll do all the work for you for free. And it's just a feature of being a member of Prime. And we'll manage all that energy for you. It makes so much sense. And it is mathematically accretive for Amazon to do that. It's not accretive for the existing energy industry because they get blown up. It's extremely accretive for peace and prosperity. If you think the number of wars we fight over natural resources, take them all off the table if we don't need energy from abroad. There's no reason to fight. <laughs> You'd have to find a reason to fight. Um, meaning, sorry, there'd, there'd be a moral reason to fight. But the last number of wars that we fought uh, were not as much rooted in morality as they were rooted in. Yeah, it feels like they were very much rooted in uh, conflict over, over resources, yeah. energy specifically. And then, sorry, just the last thing I want to say, I keep interrupting, apologies, but the chips, all what, what people want to say is that, you know, now that we're at two and three nanometer scale, for typical kind of like transistor fab, we're done. And, you know, forget about transistor density, forget about Moore's Law, it's over. And I would just say, no, look at teraflops. And really teraflops is the combination of CPUs, but much and much less important. And really is the combination of ASICs, so application specific ICs and GPUs. And so you put the two together. I mean, if I gave you a billion dollars five years from now, the amount of damage you could do, damage in good way, in terms of you know, building racks and racks of GPUs, the kind of models that you could build, the training sets and the data that you could consume to solve a problem. It's it's enough to, to do something really powerful, whereas today it's not yet quite enough. That is quite the understatement from Jamath. Why do you think there's so few Elons? It's an extremely lonely set of trade-offs. Because to your point, if you get tested, so if you think about it again, probabilistically, there's 8 billion people in the world maybe 50 of them get put in a position where they are building something of such colossal importance that they even have this choice. And then of that 50, maybe 10 of them are put in a moment where they actually have to make a trade-off. You know, you're not going to be able to see your family. I'm making this up. You're not going to be able to see your family. You're not, you know, you're going to have to basically move into your factory. You're going to have to sleep on the floor. But here's the outcome, energy independence and, you know, resource abundance and peace, and, you know, a massive peace dividend. And then he says to himself, I don't know that he did because I've never had this company. Yeah, you know what? That's worth it. And like, and then you look at your kids and you're like, I'm making this decision. I don't know how to explain that to you. Yeah. You want to be in that position? There's no, there's no amount of money where I would want to be in that position. So that takes an enormous fortitude and a moral compass that he has. And that's what I think people need to need to appreciate about that guy. It's also on the first number you said, it's confusing that there's 50 people or 10 people like that are put in the position to have that level of impact. It's, un it's unclear that that has to be that way. It seems like there could be much more. There should be. There's definitely people with the potential on the corner for that place and raise these three kids and just have to. So how many people are going to start with those boundary conditions, you know, and really grind it out? It's just very few people in the end that, um, will have the resiliency to stick it through where you don't give in to the self-doubt. And so it, uh, you know, it's a really, it's just a really hard set of boundary conditions where you can have 50 or a hundred of these people. That's why they needed to be really, they need to be really appreciated. Yeah. Well, that's true for all humans that follow the, the thread of their passion and do something beautiful in this world that could be on a small scale or a big.